video, we're going to show you the next steps on doing your Tahoe overlanding solid axle swap in your GMT 400 or OBS Chevy. If you're just now joining us, this is a step-by-step -step video series showing you how to install your Tahoe overlanding solid axle conversion kit on your full-size GM. Stay tuned. Solid axle conversion isn't done, but we're at a pretty far along step. What that is to start mocking everything up and putting it under, under its own weight. So what we've done here is we've removed the Dodge brake rotor, the Dodge brake caliper. You can see here the uh, brake caliper mounting bolts. That's how you know this is the right year of knuckle for the Tahoe landing axle swap. It needs to mount the caliper for these two large bolts. So that's, if you're ever looking at a knuckle, you can't uh, determine if it's a 2000 or 2001 like you need. This is how you can tell. So you see the axle shaft here. It's the same spline of axle shaft as the GM hubs, and it's the same bolt pattern. So I have leftover parts that I use for mock-up, just save the brand new stuff for the final assembly. So this right here is a GMT 900 hub. This is the most ideal hub to use. So this is a GMT 400 we're doing the swap on, but the 900 is a better hub. So uh, you can use any of them, they all work, but I prefer to use the 900. When you do use a 900 hub, you have to switch the um, ABS sensor out, take that bolt out and switch the ABS sensor out. So um, sometime, if you're gonna do that, just make sure you switch your ABS sensor so your uh, system recognizes it. But you can see here, it's a pretty simple, we're, we're just gonna slip this on. We're not even gonna put a brake caliper on because we just wanna put it on, under its own weight just to check everything. But, slides right on, and you have to use the Dodge hub bolt, not the Chevy hub bolt. The Chevy hub bolt is too short. So, thread these on. And what I really like about the GMT 900 hub versus the 400 hub and the 800 hub is that even for mock-up or even for driving, you don't even actually have to have the spindle nut tightened or even in place. So what I'm going to do for this test is I'm not even going to tighten the spindle nut. I'm going to put a nut on because it will hold the weight of the vehicle and be fine the way that it's built without having the hub held together by the spindle nut. This being a GMT 400, you will have to use GMT 800 brake rotors, but that's better because they are a larger rotor than the GMT 400. So uh, just know that if you're doing this on a GMT 400, you'll need to use GMT 800 brake rotors. All right, let's talk death wobble. Does the Tahoe overlanding axle swap death wobble? Or how many times do I hear, I don't want to get death wobble? You won't. We do use a Dodge axle, and Dodges do get death wobble, but it's not because of the axle. The things that cause death wobble are not being transferred over to the um, truck when you do a Tahoe overlanding axle swap. The steering is different. It's a different geometry of steering. That's why we have to cut off the sway bar mounts because the steering is in a different relationship to the axle than it is on a Dodge. And Dodge suspension components like their, um, and Dodge suspension components like the control arms have those soft rubber bushings and uh, they are, they're not the same kind of joints. They're also a short arm and a parallel four link. We're using a long arm with a radius arm. There is literally nothing in common on this axle and no one is getting death wobble on these because you're not, you don't have a potential for it. And I get asked, can I use the T-style the steering on my truck? Let me show you why we supply the Y steering. First things first, the T steering is unnecessary. All of the things that that solves on a Dodge truck are not present on a Chevy. It's a different truck. It's a different arm geometry. It's a different steering geometry. So it's, it's not the same. And also, uh, there's, a, there's a reason that we don't provide it. Take a look at this. So the steering box on the Chevy is in a different relationship to the axle than it, than it would be on a Dodge. So this right here is the Y style. And look right here. I mean, that's like a quarter of an inch. If we had the T style with this thing sitting up here and then going up across, look what it's getting into. And that's also why we run that size of steering link because we have a really tight space to fit all of these links into. It's not as simple as 
put giant two inch diameter you know, drag links on there because things won't clear. This is a tight package. Let's talk about why the Tahoe overlanding axle swap does not require you to change out your transfer case and do a solid axle conversion. So it's this thing right here. This is a slip yoke eliminator, but it's different than any others that you see on the market. So the factory transfer cases in these full-size Chevys cannot have the back half of the transfer case taken off while the transfer case is in the vehicle. So not only do you need a slip yoke eliminator, but you also need one that can be installed from the outside because you don't want to have to tear the whole transfer case out of the vehicle just to install it. So we've got this. Big splined end. That end goes right there where the uh, factory front drive shaft went. So you put the big fat, big long splined end in. And then all you've got to do is put a, a couple of really good tack welds right here to keep it from pulling out. All, this, all the force, all the load is held by those big long splines. You just need to tack weld that. And this collar and this lip is actually smaller than the diameter of the seal. So if you make sure and just do small profile tack welds, you'll still be able to change this seal out if you ever need to. We got a new output shaft seal right here. And you'll note that it slides right over the welds without any issue. Okay, so now it's U-joint and drive shaft. So the axle we use, which is a 2000 or 2001 Dodge Ram Dana 44, usually comes with a 1330 U-joint right here. And the drive shafts that work the best on these Chevys is uh, a 1310 drive shaft. Most of the time you can actually pick them up from a wrecking yard. So you'll need to use a U-joint at this end a 5-134X U-joint. And then if you don't end up saving from the wrecking yard from with the axle, the bolts and the straps that hold this on, that's no big deal. You just need to get a Spicer part number 2-70-18X. And the reason why we do a 1310 is on, the exhaust is actually removed, but usually the exhaust, the catalytic converter is right here. And a 1310 drive shaft is just usually a hair smaller and it clears a lot better. Plus, the slip yoke eliminator that we provide with the Tahoe for landing kit is a 1310 double carton uh, slip yoke eliminator. And it needs to be because if you look, if we spin this, there is not a lot of space right here. There is not a lot of space right here between the yoke and the encoder motor, the shift motor. So it's gotta be a 1310. This drive shaft is different than the drive shaft we use on the GMT 800s. Uh, the GMT 800 uses a drive shaft from like a 1999, uh, I think, uh, Dodge Durango. That won't work on this one. Those are like 27 and something inches long. This one is actually for the GMT 400 needs to be about 30 inches working length, 30 inches in the middle of it. Uh, so uh, we don't know yet at this point if there's any wrecking yard drive shafts that are easy installs like there is for the GMT 800s. You might have to get a longer shaft and have it shortened or have one made if you've got a GMT 400. Okay, you'll forgive me if I'm squished up under here, but this next step has to happen underneath the vehicle under its own weight. And that is setting the actual U-joint working angle at the pinion. We use a double carton drive shaft and double carton drive shafts really prefer the working angle at the pinion end to be close to zero, zero to even one, maybe one and a half degrees, absolutely tops. So if you can get it to zero, that's the most ideal. So what we'll do is I'm going to take my trusty digital angle finder and we're going to stick it to the yoke of the drive shaft and we're going to see uh, the differences in angles between the two yokes because that's how we're going to know. So you're going to need to find some machine surfaces that are square. So on this yoke, you can see that's a flat machine surface, and on this yoke, there's a flat one right by the U-joint cup. 13.9. Actually, let's stick it to it like this. We're about 12 degrees. About 11 degrees. So let's see if we can shallow that up a little bit. Okay. 
you can't see on camera, I'm just spinning that upper locating arm. I've actually got the other one completely removed for now, just so I only have to adjust one at a time. So that way I'm not going back and forth and back and forth. Now, when you do this, you do want to see if you can, if you're going to be within, you know, a little bit within a half a degree, if you're not going to be perfect, try to have it pinioned down if you can. And the reason for that is, is that's also caster angle and a little bit of caster angle, a little extra doesn't hurt anything. Okay, so it looks like, what is that, 11.4. Put that up against that edge. 11.1. I'm going to call that good enough. That's perfect. We can be within half a degree. And if it, if it vibrates we can, when we're driving it, we can go ahead and hop out and adjust it. But we now know that it's, I mean, it's pretty dang close. Now it's time to talk bump stops. So these bump stops, the ones I like to use, see how they've got like a little steps on them. So if you ever needed to lower them, you can actually trim off that rubber incrementally and they thread in so you can stack fender washers on the back if you need to drop them to be fine tune it as well and you see i just took some you know pieces i had pieces of tubing i had lay around and there's a nut welded on the inside of that we can thread that on and make the bump stops be installed and notice how they're welded on at the slope so they're level so that it's contacting, you know, square like this, because it was at the angle of the frame, it might put stress on the stud. So I try to make them square to the um, travel of the, of the suspension rather than square to the slope of the frame. It's time to make some brake lines. Let's take... Bend it this way, bend it that way, and then There we go. Leaking like crazy, of course. Losing fluid.
Okay, so I've got a cap on this um, brake line right here, but cut this brake line right about here because it ends at the wrong spot. You need to extend it. So what we'll do is we'll extend it. What I like to do is take a piece of brake line from the auto parts store and use an existing flare, so you only have to do one, and you'll bend it up and over to tie into this one. Not quite 90 degrees, want to make sure that it's close. I'm just kind of eyeballing it. Um, let's go a little bit more. Just a little more. A little tubing bender. Okay. It's always easier to unbend a little if you have to. Okay, now I gotta flare that. So that's a coupler, see? And just put the fittings on and then put a coupler. Okay, so on this passenger side, you've got a have one that drops out on the back side of the coil mount and then joins into the cross joins into the main brake line to extend it but driver's side you can just turn the factory uh, just bend the factory line down to go to the same spot be sure to check out the next video in the series to see the next step we're gonna go through this step by step and show you every step you need to do